Step 3, lasers 1. So in the previous step, we said that we are looking for the source of coherent light. To remind you, coherent light is in phase, it's monochromatic, and it travels in the same direction. So you may have guessed that uh, this source is a laser. But what does laser stand for? It's an acronym for Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. So let's break down this title a little bit and see what it means. First, we will talk about stimulated emission. This is the physical process behind lasing. It's a new type of light-matter interaction, and it is responsible for producing coherent light. We will also see that in the process of producing this coherent light, the light itself gets amplified. This allows us uh, to create very intense light, much more intense uh, when compared to, uh, to incandescent light sources. So let's review the three fundamental light-matter interactions. We have already seen two of those. The first one, let's consider our, again, our two-level atom, which is in the excited state. After some time, we said that such an uh, atom will uh, de-excite, it will transition into its uh, ground state, and in the process of doing that, it will give out energy in the form of a photon traveling in some random direction. This is a spontaneous emission. We have also seen uh, how to uh, excite an atom uh, by having it interact with a photon tuned to uh, the energy difference between the energies of the excited state and the ground state. That uh, uh, such a photon can interact with an atom in its ground state. The atom then receives this energy, becomes excited, and transitions to the excited state. This is uh, known as stimulated absorption. The third uh, fundamental light-matter interaction is the following. We have the atom it is sitting in the excited state. And this time, a photon of the right frequency corresponding to the energy difference between the excited state and the ground state uh, comes along, at, and it stimulates the uh, atom. And what can happen is that the atom transitions down to its ground state, without absorbing the, uh, uh, the initial photon, of course. So the initial photon is there. But while the atom is transitioning from the excited state to the ground state, it also has to give out energy, and it does it in a form of another photon. And this process is known as stimulated emission. And these two photons, they have the same frequencies, they have travel in the same direction, they are of the same phase, and on top of that, they also have the uh, same polarization. So, these two photons are coherent with each other. Therefore, stimulated emission produces coherent light. And as you may have seen or understood from the previous uh, uh, slide, uh, such a light it also gets amplified. Why is that? Imagine that uh, this green box represents our excited atom. So we have one excited atom that interacts with some incoming photon. And we saw that uh, this scenario produces two photons. Now these two photons can uh, separately interact with two more excited atoms. So after stimulated emission, what we get is we've got four photons. So you see we've got these cascading effects where excited atoms are producing more and more photons uh, uh, which are uh, coherent. However, there is one problem, and that's that not all of the atoms are usually found in the excited state. Getting an atom into an excited state is actually uh, quite a difficult process. Getting all of them into an excited state is way more difficult. So let's do some basic accounting. Well, let's say that we've got an atom, and then we've got one incoming photon. What can happen is that this photon completely ignores the atom, nothing happens. So we've got one photon in, and we've got one photon out. Then we've got the other scenario, where the uh, atom is found in the ground state, and it interacts with an incoming photon. And what happens uh, through um, stimulated absorption, the photon gets absorbed, atom gets excited. So there are no photons coming out. 
or what uh, we saw what can happen through the process of stimulated emission. If the atom is in the excited state, the incoming photon stimulates the atom, it uh, jumps, it transitions to the ground state, and we obtain two photons coming out. So, let's look at the first, first one. When no interaction occurs, we've got one photon coming in, one photon coming out. The number of photons is conserved. If there is some interaction, like in these two cases, we've got two photons coming in, and also we have two photons coming out. So again, the number of photons has not really changed. Let's consider the following uh, scenario. Let's start with all the uh, atoms, in this case we have four of them, in the ground state. This capital NG uh, represents the number of photons in the ground state, and capital NE represents the number of photons in the excited state. And let's say that we've got some photon coming along. What can happen is that only stimulated absorption, because all of the uh, atoms are found in the ground state. So let's say that the second one becomes excited. It absorbs the photon and transitions to uh, the excited state. So fine, now we've got three atoms in the ground state and one atom in the excited state. Then another photon comes along, again, of the right frequency. And what can happen? Well, now we have, to, now we have two pro, uh, possibilities. One possibility is that uh, the atom gets uh, absorbed and excites one of the three remaining atoms, or it interacts with uh, that one atom in the excited state and causes sti stimulated emission. But there's only one atom in the excited state and there are three atoms in the ground state. So it's far more likely that um, stimulated absorption occurs. So let's just say for the sake of concreteness that this is the case. So again, stimulated absorption is more likely to occur. So and uh, well, let's say that the first atom gets excited. Now we've got equal number of atoms in the ground state as uh, atoms in the excited state. So let's go on and consider another photon coming along. Now uh, the probability uh, that uh, this photon will become absorbed or that it stimulates emission from one of the excited atoms is equal because two atoms are in the ground state, two atoms are in the excited state. But let's say that the, this particular photon becomes uh, absorbed. So what happens? One of the photons from the ground state transitions into the excited state. And now you see that if another photon comes along, it is far more likely that actually it stimulates an, an emission from one of these three uh, atoms in the excited state because there's more of them. So this shows us that in order to have a good chance of um, stimulated emission, we require most of the atoms or the majority of the atoms to be in the excited state. So we write it down as follows. We require that Ne is larger than Ng. And this condition, this situation is referred to as population inversion. And that's because we inverted the population uh, from the ground state where majority is in the excited state. However, there's still one more obstacle. How do we actually achieve population inversion? Because consider this, if the majority of our atoms are in the ground state, then it's far more likely to absorb the incoming photon. So the Ne, the number of excited atoms, increases. On the other hand, if we already have population inversion, if we have the majority of the atoms in the excited state, then we are more likely to cause stimulated emission, which increases the number of photons in the ground state meaning we are losing the atoms in the contributing towards the population inversion. So what tends to happen in a two-level system is that the system likes to pick some type of equilibrium where the number of excited states and the number of uh, uh, atoms in the ground state are approximately equal. So this is not exactly what we want. We are aiming to maintain our atoms in the excited state. We want population inversion. So how do we do it? And the answer to that we will find lies in abandoning our two-level atomic friends 
and moving at least to a three-level atom. And we're going to explain exactly how that works in the next step.